after the two interesting sessions looking at the clinical and the basic papers we now move on to the paul bacon lecture i think we all know uh, who paul bacon was and uh, i also had a luxury to uh, the opportunity i would say to meet him during my dm training days and uh, without further delay i would like to call upon the chairperson for this session uh, mahindra nath sir he is a senior consultant rheumatologist uh, at bangalore and dr r n mishra he is head department of clinical immunology and rheumatology at kims bhubneshwar and i would also like to invite uh, bg dharmanand sir the president of indian rheumatology association on the stage my colleague ramnath mishra and uh, friends of in the indian room from the indian rheumatology association in the audience so one of the most important uh, event of the irakan from last two years has been the three years has been the paul bacon memorial oration uh, most of you know who is paul bacon for the uninitiated the younger generation who doesn't know him ramnath will say a few words on paul bacon to him long time he first came to the bangalore conference in 1997 and again uh, when i organized the event in lucknow in 1999 he mooted uh, the idea of creating a special interest group called the airavas and uh, he visited every year twice or thrice and till his last visit in 2016 he visited us almost 53 times and um, if you he has this uh, picture as you saw lord ganesh and lakshmi in his own garden this is the place where the first uh, bilag meeting was held the bilag score which is an instrument to measure sle that was initiated by paul and uh, the instrument that we devised by the airavas group he he was the instrumental in gelling us motivating us and uh, it's it's a very sad loss that he passed away and perhaps in his last phase of life he used to remember airavas or the indian rheumatology association If you have read his obituary written by David Scott, Justin Mason, Rashid Lukmani, uh, you would know his love for Indian Rheumatology Association. Uh, and uh, last but not the least, of his will, he has kept aside a money, a fund. for the indian rheumatology association sometime uh, you you feel that he was more indian than perhaps we are thank you this year paul bacon's oration will be delivered by david jain professor of medicine at uh, university of cambridge David Jain is an old friend of India. He had come to Vellore meeting. In fact, uh, just before COVID in 9, 2019, we wanted to have a vasculitis meeting, and Ramesh Joyce was very keen, and David had agreed to come. Unfortunately, David's mother uh, fell ill. She had an aneurysm 
of the aorta and she had to undergo a thoracic surgery at that time. So David cancelled his visit in the last minute. But David has promised us he will come. But today also, unfortunately, is not with us. It's going to be a virtual talk. And David Jain has a lot of work on vasculitis. And now most of the new papers and clinical trials, every paper begins with David's uh, name and work. Uh, let us listen to David Jain, what he's going to say. Thank you for the invitation to speak at the 39th Conference of the Indian Rheumatology Association. My title is Newer Treatment Options for Anchor Vasculitis, and my name is David Jane, and I'm working from Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Uh, these are my disclosures. I'm going to touch on current definitions and outcomes of anchor associated vasculitis a recent update to the European recommendations and then newer trends in treatment. We still classify primary systemic vasculitis according to the Chapel Hill consensus system of 2012, which introduced the term of anchor associated vasculitis and the new names of granulomatosis with polyangiitis the vaginas and eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis for EGPA. This talk focuses on anchor vasculitis, and we recognize that these are overlapping clinical syndromes with a close association with proteinase 3 anchor for GPA, myeloperoxidase anchor for MPA, uh, and eGPA, where only a minority of patients are anchor positive. We recognize there are renal limited and localized variants, which may be anchor negative. In the UK, uh, incidence is 20 per million and prevalence over 300 million. So technically rare, but actually we see quite these patients very frequently. A breakthrough in our understanding of anchor vasculitis was a genome-wide association study which demonstrated that the genetic variants for proteinase 3 anchor vasculitis are completely different to that for myeloperoxidase anchor associated vasculitis, suggesting these are two different genetic conditions, although with a very similar clinical phenotype. There are some variants, such as SERPINA1, which codes for alpha-1 antitrypsin, and PTPN22, which is involved in T-cell activation, which were found in both syndromes. This suggests that in the future, we will be diagnosing anchor vasculitis according to the anchor type rather than the phenotype. This is a heterogeneous disease, and an attempt to summarize the phenotypic spectrum, we wrote an editorial led by Alfred Marr, which stressed that there is granulomatous disease at one end of the spectrum, typically involving the respiratory tract, and vasculitis at the other end of the spectrum, typically involving the kidney, the peripheral nerves. This end tends to be more MPO anchor, this end tends to be more PR3 anchor, higher relapse risk here, lower relapse risk here. In terms of anchor, the current anchor test to, to associate with these diseases is the specific proteinase 3 or MPO anchor assay. The fluorescence assay has too poor an association with the diagnoses, and we recommend laboratories all do the specific anchor tests. There has been a large uh, program of data collection to improve our ability to classify the different vasculitis syndromes, and these have resulted in a number of publications earlier this year. This is an initiative led by the American College of Rheumatology and ULAR, and we now have classification criteria for the anchor vasculitis syndromes. And I'm showing you on this slide the criteria for GPA, and this scores points according to clinical and laboratory criteria, and if you're greater than five, then this is compatible with a diagnosis of granulomatosis with polyangitis. I emphasize these are not diagnostic criteria, but these uh, define one syndrome against another syndrome in a patient thought to have vasculitis. You will see these entering research quite shortly. 
This remains a severe disease. This is a population-based study from Sweden showing the excess mortality in the solid line compared to a control population. And when we look at the subgroups, it's those with kidney involvement, either PR3 or without PR3, that drive the adverse mortality. And if your patients do not have kidney involvement, then their long-term survival approaches the background population. So the emphasis with this disease is to encourage early referral and early diagnosis before the kidneys are too badly affected. Another important aspect of the outcome of vasculitis is damage, and almost all patients accrue at least one item of damage. We'd have a tool called the Vasculitis Damage Index, and this summarizes damage at five years caused by the disease and caused by the treatment. And you'll see that steroids, cyclophosphamide, have been important drivers of treatment-related damage. Clearly, goals for the future for future treatments are more effective treatment, uh, treatment to minimize disease-related damage and safer treatment to reduce treatment-related damage. So moving to the recommendations. So we have had international recommendations since 2009. These were updated in 2016. The American College of Rheumatology produced guidelines in 2019 and we have recently updated the European guidelines. One of the statements we made was the importance of obtaining remission, and this should be the goal of induction therapy. And these slides demonstrate that if you attain remission, the blue line, your patient's mortality risk and end-stage kidney disease is greatly reduced than if you don't obtain remission, which are the other lines. So this should be the focus of induction therapy. We presented the ULAR update for the management of anchor-associated vasculitis at the ULAR meeting in June of this year, and this paper is currently in press and will be freely available shortly. For remission induction, we've emphasized the combination of steroids with either rituximab or cyclophosphamide, but rituximab is probably preferred, especially for PR3 anchor disease. Rituximab is also preferred in relapsing disease. The data for rituximab is now quite old and is based on two randomized controlled trials, one affecting new patients with less severe disease, where there was no difference in outcome between rituximab and cyclophosphamide, except for the relapsing patients who did better with rituximab, and a second study focusing on severe renal disease, where rituximab was combined with low-dose cyclophosphamide against conventional-dose cyclophosphamide, where there was no difference in the outcome. Recently, we've completed a large study of rituximab for relapsing disease, when all patients were induced or were re-induced with rituximab. And this graph demonstrates the efficacy of rituximab for treating relapsing GPA or MPA with 91% obtaining remission within four months. Now, we've had very little work on steroid dosing in ankyovasculitis and many differences in practice around the world, but we do, know, do now have a randomized controlled trial, PEXIVAS, which addressed two questions for patients with more severe ankyovasculitis, that is GFR less than 50 or lung hemorrhage. It looked at plasma exchange, but here I'm gonna focus on steroids because we compared two different steroid regimens. You'll see on the right slide, the two different regimens, the so-called standard regimen, starting at 60 and going down in steps, and the reduced regimen, which also starts at 60 for a week, that's 60 milligrams a day, but then halves to 30 and goes down more rapidly. There's approximately a 50% difference in exposure of steroids, and there was no difference in terms of efficacy uh, for the endpoint in this trial, which was death or end-stage renal disease. But there was a benefit of the reduced dose steroid, which reduced serious infections compared to standard dose. And the PEXIVAS reduced dose steroid regimen is now the recommended steroid regimen for ankyovasculitis. 
The second question for Pexivas concerned plasma exchange, and there is considerable debate as to whether this expensive intervention has a role in ankylvasculitis. Pexivas did not demonstrate a beneficial effect of plasma exchange on the composite of end-stage renal failure or death, shown here in the two curves. In a subsequent meta-analysis, a benefit for kidney failure at one year was demonstrated, and there has subsequently been a BM British Medical Journal rapid recommendation statement, which we have also copied into the ULAR statement, suggesting for the most severe patients, there is a weak recommendation for plasma exchange. What that means is you will not be criticized for not using plasma exchange, you'll not be criticized for using plasma exchange, but there is a weak benefit of plasma exchange for the most severe patients, but it should certainly not be used for the patients with less severe kidney disease. Once your patient is in remission, in the new recommendations, we suggest use of rituximab to maintain remission. Although we state that the older treatments, azathioprine or methotrexate, are alternatives. This is a trial that compared two years to four years of azathioprine and steroid after cyclophosphamide induction. And it makes the point that if you stop the treatment, which is the red line, the withdrawal group here, at two years, you see an excess of relapses compared to carrying on with the treatment. This simply makes the point that this is a long-term relapsing remitting disease, and if you withdraw therapy, the relapse risk goes up. What about with rituximab? Well, we have two randomized trials, both uh, giving fixed interval dosing of rituximab, 500 milligrams every six months in main ritzen, and a gram every four months in ritazoran. Main ritzen recruited new patients, gave cyclophosphamide induction, Ritazarum recruited relapsing patients and gave rituximab induction, but essentially the results are the same, namely that rituximab is superior to azathioprine, and this led to the recommendation. The recommendation is for the main ritzen dose of 500 milligrams every six months, with the option to either increase the dose or reduce the interval if this does not work, which it doesn't for a minority of patients. The problem with rituximab is what happens when you stop. Here is when we gave the last dose of rituximab in main ritzen, and about a year later, the relapse risk accelerates. So rituximab works while the patient is receiving it, but once the rituximab is out of the system, the relapse risk returns. Main ritzen 3 was a follow-on trial from the trial I showed in the previous slide, where patients were recruited having had two years of rituximab and either continued on rituximab, the solid line, or stopped rituximab. And again, you see the excess relapses when rituximab is stopped. So as clinicians, it's not wrong to stop the rituximab after two years, but we have to accept and plan for an increased relapse risk, which means more monitoring, closer contact of the patient to the clinic to alert if they are relapsing. A further problem with rituximab is that of secondary immunodeficiency. Um, we have observed an IgG level below five grams per liter in 40% of our rituximab treated cohort. But this is over a 15 year experience. Most patients tolerate an IgG less than five very well, but if the IgG goes below three, they develop recurrent infections and require IgG replacement. So our recommendations are that you monitor IgG every six months if you're gonna use rituximab and you treat with caution uh, if the IgG is starting to fall below five. The predictors for development of immunodeficiency are previous treatment with cyclophosphamide and the IgG when you give Rituximab. If it's already low, it's going to go lower. <clears throat> I'm now going to change and say a little bit about eGPA, that is formerly Churg Strauss vasculitis. And this had been an area with very little clinical trial activity. 
We performed in Europe a genome-wide association study, and this demonstrated that the anchor positive group, which is around 40%, had similar genetic variants to MPO anchor uh, GPA or MPA. But the anchor negative group had completely different genetic background. And we feel that this will lead to a change in the classification of eGPA according to anchor status. We also identified a number of interesting variants associated particularly with anchor negative eGPA, including interleukin-5, which is a cytokine which uh, stimulates eosinophil production and activation. And this provided some of the rationale for the use of the anti-interleukin-5 monoclonal antibody, mepolizumab. And on the basis of a successful randomized controlled trial in the recommendations, we now recommend the use of mepolizumab for relapsing or refractory eGPA. This is the data. The trial was called MIRA. And in this trial, prevalent eGPA patients on steroids were recruited and then the steroids were driven down to less than five milligrams a day. And remission was no disease activity and a steroid dose of less than five. And this was achieved in 30 to 40 percent of the MEPO patients, but very few of the control patients. And the right hand graph shows relapse, which was much higher in the placebo group. Our experience with this drug is really quite benign. Unfortunately, it's expensive but patients that start it tend to remain on it and benefit from it long term. What about newer trends of therapy? Well, the exciting drug this year is Avacapan. And Avacapan was licensed in the US just over a year ago and has recently been licensed in Europe and we're beginning to gain experience in the clinic. In the recommendations, we now mention that avacapan can be used in combination with either rituximab or cyclophosphamide for induction of GPA or MPA, and that its use will substantially reduce exposure to steroids. So what is the data behind avacapan? Well, avacapan is a complement inhibitor, and this is a cartoon of the complement pathway with the afferent loops, the amplification loops, excuse me, I'm just gonna go back, and then the effector limbs, particularly through C5 and C3, C3A, C3B. Avacapan is a specific inhibitor of the C5A receptor, which is one of two receptors that C5A binds to. Avacapan is different from echolizumab, which you will know as an inhibitor of C5, echolizumab blocks both C5A signaling and C5B signaling, important for protection against meningitis, for example. The key preclinical pre data uh, that led to avacapan being developed for anchor vasculitis was this experiment, where an MPO anchor model of vasculitis had the human C5A receptor knocked in and developed vasculitis, here a glomerular crescent, whereas the knockout with no C5A receptor developed no disease. When the model was repeated with an inhibitor, CCX168, now called avacapan, there was no disease as judged by the crescent score. Further studies of this model looked at the second C5A receptor, known as C5L2, and knockout of the second receptor, if anything, made the disease worse, suggesting this receptor may be a decoy or negative receptor. And knocking out elements of the classical pathway here, C6, had no impact. So in this model, the vasculitis is dependent on a functional C5A receptor and exquisitely sensitive to C5A. So this was the confirmatory trial called Advocate, where 300 patients were randomized either to avacapan, here called CCX168, or steroids. The, the intention was the avacapan group got no steroid. In fact, they did get some. And the steroid got, got conventionally dosed steroid tapered to zero by 21 weeks. <clears throat> 
All patients received a background of rituximab or cyclophosphamide followed by azathioprine. And, and the primary endpoints were at six months and 12 months in terms of remission or sustained remission. This is the 12 month endpoint of sustained remission, and there was a benefit in favor of vacapan of 12.5% over the prednisone group suggesting more patients given a vacapan achieved sustained remission at week 52 than given steroids. This was mainly driven by a difference in relapse, and this graph shows the time to relapse for the avacapan group in red and the prednisone group in gray, with a hazard ratio of approximately 0.5 uh, between the two uh, treatment groups. Other benefits, and these were predefined secondary endpoints, were quality of life. Now, vasculitis patients have remarkably suppressed quality of life at diagnosis, and this does often not improve much for many, many months. And indeed, if you look at the physical component score on the left, which is a composite of these four dimensions on the right, you can see that the change from baseline in this, the prednisone group in gray was relatively modest at week 26 and week 52, but there were significant and clinically significant improvements in quality of life in the avacapan group at week 26 and week 52. Now, we don't understand what's driving this change in quality of life, but my opinion is it is not just steroid because when we looked at the differences in quality of life in the previous study I presented, Pexivas, with two different steroid regimens, we found no, no differences in quality of life change. Another benefit of avacapan was kidney function recovery. Now, this trial included patients with normal kidney function or kidney function impairment down to a GFR of 15. And for those patients with kidney function impairment, there was greater recovery of kidney function shown here in the red line of acapan compared to the prednisone group. And this shows the absolute difference, which is around 3, 3.5 mils a minute increased recovery of kidney function. Now, the long-term significance of this is going to be a lower risk of end-stage kidney disease for these patients, which is clinically very important. We believe the reason for this better recovery of kidney function is that avacapan is working more quickly and switching disease off more completely than we are achieving with our current uh, regimens using high dose steroids. So the question now is how should we integrate avacapan into our practice now that it's becoming available? Clearly it's gonna be expensive. And what we're anticipating is two phases. The first phase is to use avacapan in patients in whom there is a clear contraindication to steroids, such as osteoporosis, psychosis, diabetes, etc. Another group, and this, were, this was not a group studied in advocate, are patients with refractory disease for whom we have no good treatment options. So they've already received rituximab or cyclophosphamide or both. They've already received considerable steroid exposure, and we don't have further options. And I think this group will have a lot to gain from avacapan. The third group are those presenting with a low GFR. As I demonstrated in the previous slide, we believe these patients will benefit from an increased GFR recovery in terms of long-term end-stage kidney disease risk. So these are the groups we're planning to use avacapan in at the moment. And indeed, we have real world experience of use of avacapan in these subgroups, and it's showing similar data to that that we reported in Advocate. <coughs> in time, avacapan may become routine, rather like rituximab has become routine for induction, in which case the recommendation would be to use it for 12 months as a component of induction therapy and try to avoid or minimize the use of any steroid. At the moment, there is no specific safety risk with avacapan that has been demonstrated. Overall, in the advocate trial, there were fewer adverse events in the avacapan group compared to the prednisone group. 
but my opinion is that this is driven by the, the, the difference in steroid exposure between the groups. Uh, but we, as yet, and with relatively limited exposure to two to 300 patients, have no specific safety concerns with Avacapan. There are outstanding questions. Should, would we do better if we did give some steroid with Avacapan? Possibly. In one of the phase twos, we gave low dose, 20 milligrams of prednisone, and this did seem to help. What to do after a year? We have no data after a year. And clearly some patients fail on the Vacapan, and we need to define how quickly they can be identified and then given other therapies. The last uh, aspect I'm gonna to touch on is methods of targeting B cells. This has largely been driven by the success of rituximab. But we do have other CD20 monoclonals in development, and one is obinutizumab, which is a so-called type 2 CD20, much more effective than rituximab in B-cell depletion, successful in lupus nephritis in phase 2, and now entering trials in ankylvasculitis. We have a Batacept that you'll be familiar with in rheumatoid arthritis, which is a co-stimulatory inhibitor. And there is an ankyvasculitis trial in GPA, which has recently completed recruitment, and you may hear some results in a year or so. And this may be an alternative to rituximab for patients at risk of immunodeficiency, which would be useful. In Cambridge, we are studying anti-BAF antibodies, belimumab, licensed in lupus, in combination with rituximab. And our hypothesis is that following rituximab induction, Belimumab will be effective and safer than rituximab in maintaining remission. And we have a trial that is, uh, has recently been completed and due to report next year, which will uh, assess whether, whether we, we believe this hypothesis is true. So in addition to the new data with the Vacapan, I think you will see emerging data over the next year or two with these other B cell targeted agents. My take home messages are that ankyvasculitis is a heterogeneous multi-system inflammatory disease and we have clearly defined subgroups and with the recent ACR ULAR exercise we now have criteria to differentiate the syndromes more accurately. In terms of treatment and outcomes the headline outcomes are improving but unfortunately our patients still suffer from many aspects of chronic morbidity. Rituximab is probably the preferred induction agent, and I've discussed rituximab in maintenance. We don't know how long to treat for, and we also have the immunodeficiency risk. We do have data to define how we should use steroids, certainly for severe disease, and we now have new data with Avacapan, which essentially is going to reduce steroid doses much further. It's important to stress that this is a long-term disease and there is a need for long-term treatment and management. I've talked about mepolizumab and eGPA. There are also two other anti-interleukin-5 agents that we use. And my view is that this is going to transform eGPA and almost all eGPA patients will end up on an anti-interleukin-5 drug. I've given you the data on Avacapan, which I think is very exciting. And this is now in the clinical uh, arena for GPA, MPA. And I've discussed newer uh, B cell targeting approaches, which I anticipate we'll hear more about in the future. I would like to acknowledge all of my colleagues in Cambridge uh, in the various international networks that have contributed uh, to these trials that I presented. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, uh, David Jain, for his excellent oration. As uh, it's a tradition, after the oration, usually we do not have any questions or answers about it. So one more most important thing is there. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, David, it was very kind of you to give this talk. We would have been very happy if you had come personally. And uh, you know, Paul would have been very happy that you delivered the talk. And uh, Paul's uh, wife, Jean, had sent a message which we showed before the uh, talk oration. Do you have anything to say, David? <laughs>
Is there? No. Okay, thank you. So it's almost about uh, 15 years ago after uh, Paul Bacon was diagnosed with a malignancy in one of the Iraqans, he just casually mentioned, I remember it's one of the breaks and myself and Amita were there. He said, I've left a small sub Mahendranath in uh, my will. Once I go away, IRA should climb and somebody in the IRA should know about it. And uh, I didn't take it very seriously. And when he died in January after uh, six months, his solicitors contacted me. And there has been a persistent uh, correspondence between me speaking to them, IRA, Alakendu Ghosh, Sapan and all these things because uh, his donation was in uh, foreign currency. It took almost four, year, four and a half years. So this September 10th, I traveled to Cleethru where Paul Soam was there. I met Jean Bacon and Jean Bacon handed over me 5,000 pounds. And uh, on that day the exchange rate was it was 4,61,925 rupees. I added another 39,000 rupees. I was giving a check of 5 lakhs rupees on behalf of Jane and Paul Bacon to President of the Indian Rheumatology Association. And Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Aman kindly send a letter of acknowledgement to Jane Bacon. Thank you. Thank Ramnath Mishra for co-chairing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahindranath and Professor Mitchell.